Hello everybody, and welcome back to a brand new video. In today's video, we'll be doing my final ever 2022 governor's map prediction. I know it's sad, but this is our final 2022 governor's prediction. So if you're going to come back to this video to try to roast me and you want to roast me with a governor's race, this is the video for you. I'm not, I will not be changing anything after this unless something insane happens, which it probably won't. And this is, you know, coming out Saturday. So you know, we only have three days till the election, and I don't think there's enough time for anything to substantially change, so we're just going to dive into it here. Let's get started. So we're going to begin with our safe blue states. These states are California, Gavin Newsom getting reelected easily, Hawaii, open seat, but Lieutenant Governor Josh Green going to win easily, Illinois, J.B. Pritzker winning, beating Darren Bailey, Maryland, Massachusetts, both of which are Republican pick or Democratic pickups, these states have Republican governors that are not either not eligible to run again or declined to run again, and they're now going to flip blue automatically. And that is all. These are our 11 seats that are guaranteed to go Democratic. Now, let's talk about our safe Republican states. Those states are Idaho, incumbent Governor Brad Little, going to win re-election there. Mark Gordon in Wyoming, in South Dakota, Christy Nome. She had one bad internal poll, but it's, it's been pretty quiet since then. Nebraska, Carol Blood, the Democrat, falling short of Jim Pillen, who will be the Republican nominee, succeeding Pete Ricketts, although this race could get close to the 2020 presidential. Oklahoma, there was some hype about it potentially being close, but obviously Joy Hoffmeister, the Democrat, seems to have lost her momentum as the race got more nationalized. Arkansas, open seat that's going to be won by Sarah Huckabee Sanders, the former Trump press secretary. Tennessee, Bill Legan won re-election there quite easily. Alabama, K. Ivy Boy won easily. South Carolina, this race, I, I mean, I, I won't put it as safe, but it's functionally safe. We'll talk about that in a second. Iowa, Kim Reynolds has led every poll by like 17 points, and polls tend to overestimate, to overestimate Democrats in Iowa, so that could be even bigger. Ohio, similar thing. Mike DeWine leading massively in all the polls. This race won't be close. Um, then uh, Vermont and New Hampshire, both of which are usually blue states at the federal level, but have very popular incumbent Republican governors. Now, there are two states I want to get out of the way here. These are Florida and South Carolina both of which are functionally safe. But I do want to say one thing about Florida. So Florida, I originally had as likely are because I didn't think DeSantis would win by more than 15. I, I could still see it falling below 15, but the thing is I don't want to put it as likely because there is no chance in hell. In, there, there's no like there's no chance DeSantis loses. And the early vote data is so disastrous for Democrats that they might be on track for a double-digit loss in Florida, which is, you know, which would have been unheard of even two years ago. South Carolina, Joe Cunningham is a decent nominee for the Democrats, but, you know, Black turnout tends to be a bit lower during midterms, and Henry McMaster is not a bad incumbent at all, so he'll probably win re-election there. Now, let's talk about our likely Democratic states. I see a few of these. We'll start in Colorado, where Michael, or not Michael Bennett, sorry, this is the Senate race. Governor says Jared Polis has been leading Heidi Gainel by upwards of 15 points in most polls. I don't think it'll be particularly close. Um, I do think Gainel, the base, will come home from, for her. There are some Republicans who say they're undecided because they don't mind Polis, but they're going to come home for her as they'll you know, come home for Joe O'Day. And you're going to get a 13-14 you know, point victory for Jared Polis. Minnesota, Tim Walls has been leading massively in all the polls. I actually have this on my updated um, you know, aggregate. I will show you it right now. Uh, and I know we've we, we've had a new poll since then, but it doesn't really matter. It'll probably, you know, it's, it'll stay similar. We got like a Walls plus 17 poll. Maybe it goes up to D plus 6, but either way, that's a likely Democratic margin. Not that I trust the polls and everything in Minnesota, but I, you know, Scott Jensen, the Republican nominees, had very little money to compete, and Walls is a popular incumbent. He will be fine. Um, New York as well. This is another state that I think is going to go blue by under 15. It, it could be over 15, but, you know, Lee Zeldin's picked up a lot of momentum recently, and I think there's not enough time for the race to kind of shift back into Kathy Hochul's favor. You know, uh, Zeldin will likely do very well in Long Island and in the city itself. I do think he's going to be a bit overrated upstate, but he will do very well. Overall, he'll reduce the margin. Connecticut, Bob Stefanowski, Ned Lamont. This is an interesting race because it'll we'll see if Stefanowski can lose by under 10, but Lamont's a popular incumbent who's in a better position now than he was four years ago, and he's going to win by a lot more than three. Uh, Rhode Island, Dan McKee, you know, he's he, he hasn't won before, but he's the incumbent. He'll probably be fine. Then Maine, this is our final New England, likely D state to add to the collection. Originally, it looked pretty competitive, but since, you know, since then, We've gotten a few new polls that I haven't added to my aggregate yet, but it doesn't really matter. But either way, we got one new D plus six poll. Might bring it down a little bit because this aggregate has Mills up by 10. She'll probably win me close to six or seven. But either way, she has decently high approvals. And LePage is um, someone who I view to be a bit of no rated candidate. Uh, and Maine also as a whole is, you know, weird, but it, it should stay blue this year. 
Now, likely Republican states. Alaska, this is our first one. Right, like It's a three-way race between Les Guerra, the Democrat, Bill Walker, the former uh, governor who's run a, running as an independent, and then Mike Dunleavy, the GOP incumbent. Dunleavy will win. I don't know whether it'll be by like 7 or 15. It'll probably be somewhere in between, but just wanted to clarify that I think it'll be under 15-point margin. Um, our next state is Texas. Beto O'Rourke has been running a solid campaign in terms of turnout, but I don't think he's really persuading any uh, Republican voters to vote for him. And in a state like Texas, which has been leaning red historically, it's going to be hard for him to win that race. Again, some of the polls have had it like kind of close, but even then, Beto hasn't led in a single poll, and Biden led in a lot of polls in 2020 in Texas. I actually haven't done – oh, here we go. And so that's a bit of a problem for him. You know, he's down by nine in my accurate. I think he'll lose by a similar amount. Um, and yeah, that that's our those are our likely red states. So the Republicans are one. It doesn't really matter who has the majority in the NGA, but I guess figuratively, it's cool for momentum reasons. Republicans are one state away from winning this majority or getting the tie majority in the RGA or in the NGA. And if they win two more, they'll get the majority. Now, unfortunately for them, I'm moving a big race in the direction of the Democrats. It's Oregon. Oregon originally, I, I I had a lot of uh you know hype about Christine Drazen. She led in the polls, and Betsy Johnson, the independent, seemed to be taking away a lot of votes from Tina Kotek, the Democrat. But what what's happened in Oregon for these past two or three weeks is that a lot of people who are planning on voting for Betsy Johnson have now been blissed with ads in favor of Kotek. And they're and again, Oregon's a blue state, so a lot of Democrats are coming home to vote for Kotek. And a lot of the people who are voting for Betsy Johnson are now realizing it's kind of just a waste of vote, and they're you know having to pick between Drazen or Kotek. Most of the people are going to break for Kotek because, again, Oregon's a bluer state, and most of those voters are Democrats. So Drazen, I think, peaked a bit too early. She could have maybe won a few weeks ago. I actually had her as a narrow favorite two weeks ago, but what I will say is that it's been a clear uh, polling surge for Kotek. She's even up in Emerson, which has Mark Kelly and Fetterman losing. So um, I would say uh, Oregon governor moving back to lean D. Drazen could still pull off an upset. If Johnson does better in the better than she's doing in the Bulls right now, it's possible. That's why it's lean D and not safety, but I'm still fairly confident Kotek will win. I think Oregon's going to come home for the Democrats. New Mexico, this one's close to likely. The early vote data is just disastrous for Republicans right now. There's no sign of like actual turnout that they're getting. And, you know, when you look at Michelle Lujan Grishman's approval ratings, they, they're not good, but they haven't tanked enough to, I think, give Ronchetti a victory. There's a good amount of Hispanic voters in the state that seem to be you know, more favorable to Michelle Lujan Grishman than Joe Biden for whatever reason. And, um, you, you know, Mar like I think Ronchetti got a bit overhyped. He ran a really good Senate campaign in 2020, but that was mostly because the race never got nationalized because he was able to focus on more local issues. Unfortunately for him, this race got nationalized early on, and he was never able to kind of recover from it. And I think he's going to go down by four to five points on election night. Now, next lean D states, we've got two more here. These are Michigan and Pennsylvania. These are two Rust Belt states that I think could be likely. I think Pennsylvania, I'm actually being too cautious on. I'm not going to move it to likely just because I think putting Pennsylvania as likely D is just feels weird to me, so I'm not going to do it yet. What I will say is that I am pretty confident that we're going to end up seeing uh, governors Josh Shapiro, Governor Whitmer get reelected and Governor Josh Shapiro become a thing. Um, starting with Michigan, I know we, we've gotten a few new polls, and I keep saying I haven't updated my aggregate. This aggregate's like a, like three or four days old, but it doesn't change my opinion on any races. Whitmer was up by three in my aggregate a few days ago. She's probably now up by four or four and a half once I add in the new polls, which I will post on Twitter the day before the election. So go follow me on Twitter at Ryan Jakubowski just to let you guys know. But anyways, as I was saying, Michigan – um, Dixon closed the gap. She was losing by a lot early on in the summer, but she's kind of, you know, gotten the base to come home. I don't think it'll be enough. And Whitmer's going to do very well with suburban women as well as working class voters. So she's kind of building a very good coalition in her state, which makes it difficult for Dixon to knock her off. Again, I would expect there to be some level of kind of, um, in, 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 in performance by Whitmer in, you know, Macomb County in these ancestrally democratic working class regions. But for now, I'm going to keep it as lean D could be likely though. The polls have shown it to be, you know, fairly solid for what Burn Dixon's only led in one poll. So, yeah. Um, Pennsylvania, Josh Shapiro's just crushing Mastriano in all the polls. Like, like the best poll we've gotten from Mastriano is like Trafalgar, where he's down by four, and Trafalgar Trump in Pennsylvania. And like, if you're a Republican down four in Trafalgar, that's really bad. I haven't had some of the polls to the aggregate, but since then, we've gotten like a Mastriano down by 14 poll, and a Mastriano down by nine poll, and Mastriano down by four in Trafalgar. And once you adjust that for 2020 polling miss, it's also pretty bad for him. So, this will probably stay similar. I know he's like it, it would still be quite a large poll. I missed from Mastrano to end up, you know, only losing by like four and a half compared to losing by like nine and a half, which is what the polls have him losing by. But that being said, I do think that like there's a lot of Republicans right now who aren't who aren't like admitting to voting for Mastrano in the polls who will end up voting for him, kind of like a shy Mastrano voter. But it's nowhere near enough, and Shapiro's already at like fifty three percent in the polls. So I would be really surprised if Mastrano came back and won it on election day. 
Um, so yeah, these are lean D states. Now our lean R states are going to get the Republicans over the top here. I've got two of them or yeah, three of them actually. So our first lean R state, this is Nevada. Nevada early vote looks pretty bad for Democrats right now. It isn't, you know, disastrous. It isn't like 2014 levels of red wave type electorate, but it does show that Democrats are clearly lagging behind both 2020 and 2018. And yes, there have been concerns for Republicans about whether on election day, but banking on like, you know, whether to saving the, you know, cause like the hope for Democrats is that the turnout is low on election day. And if there's like bad weather, that would help that happen. But banking on low turnout on election day is always a sign you're losing. And I just think right now there's a path for Sisolak, but he's gotten, you know, he hasn't really gotten the endorsements he got back in 2018. And Joe Lombardo as a countywide official in Clark County, the state's largest and most democratic County, giving him that ability, uh, you know, that like him having the ability to appeal to a lot of Democrats within Clark who are potentially voting for him and maybe Cortez Mosto splitting their ticket. Gives him a lot of upside. I think he'll win by two and a half, three percent at the end of the day, which is very impressive for Nevada standards. He's been running a really good campaign. Next up is Wisconsin. Now, unlike Nevada, the the, the early vote in Wisconsin has been like looking like really good for Democrats. I don't know really why. Um, it's mostly that youth turnout is up massively in that Milwaukee and Madison are showing up. That being said, uh, the Wisconsin early vote can be highly misleading. In 2020, it was pretty misleading too. So it's one of the states where I don't really care about early votes. I'm kind of just ignoring it. If Evers wins, I'll have egg, I'll have egg on my face, clearly. I'll, you know, I'll, by the way, you are allowed to dunk on me um, if I get these races wrong, especially if it's a race I'm like fairly confident about. If it's like a tilt race, it's kind of cringe. But like if, if I get like Nevada or Wisconsin or Michigan wrong or something, I think it's fair game. But what I will say is that Wisconsin is to me pretty clearly tilting against Evers right now. Turnout patterns in midterms have been historically bad for Democrats in the state. The rural areas and the uh, working class regions are trending against him and He's already not very popular in the suburbs, so I don't think he'll do well there. Either way, that is a R plus three result in Wisconsin. Evers maybe has a better chance than he did a few weeks ago, but it's still not very high. Finally, Georgia. Georgia, I, I think Georgia is going to be closer than people think. I don't think Abrams really has a chance, but I think she'll lose by like five instead of seven. I say that because Kemp in that primary did really well, but there are still like, you know, hundreds of thousands of Purdue voters. Some of them might be voting libertarian. Obviously, Shane Hazel is the guy who essentially cost the GOP the Senate back in 2020 by running against Purdue and Ossoff and get, taking away some votes from Purdue. And so he's running in the governor's race. I think he'll get two and a half, three percent of the vote, and that'll be enough to kind of get Kemp to a 50. No, maybe, maybe sorry, maybe he'll get like one and a half to two percent. And that's a scenario where Kemp only wins by like five instead of seven, which he should win by. Either way, Abrams has a, a very small chance of winning. I, I know people get mad at me when I say Abrams has no chance, but he's pulling like eight percent behind Warnock with uh, white voters. And white voters in the Atlanta suburbs have tilted the state towards Democrats in the past. And I think they're going to, you know, potentially give Warnock an edge. Stay tuned for my, my final Senate prediction. We'll see who I give the edge in the Georgia Senate race. But what I will say is that there's a clear lag um, between uh, Abrams and Warnock in that regard. And Abrams has also been struggling with black men in specific in these polls as well. And while they might come home from her, it's still going to be hard for her to piece together a path to victory because it's really closing and Kemp's popular enough that he can just win easily anyways. So Georgia, Lenar. Abrams' only chance of getting into a runoff, and even then, I wouldn't bet massively on that. Now, final two states: the Arizona and Kansas. I think these states are toss-ups, and I had them both as lean on my, you know, most recent prediction from like two weeks ago. I'll like I'll keep them both as Republican. I I don't really have the guts to move either of these to Democrats. I know a lot of people think Kelly's going to win re-election in Kansas specifically. Um, what I will say is that it's closer than I thought. I had her losing by like seven at the you know beginning of the year, so it's it's moved a lot in the past eight ten months. But at, at the end of the day. I think partisanship is going to come home to same Republicans in Kansas the way it kind of saved Democrats in Oregon. And actually, you know what? I guess I'll be bullish here. I think I'll keep it as lean R. Um, Kelly did lead in our in, in the final Emerson poll, but I don't really like Emerson the cycle because they've been showing a ton of wacky cross tabs, and I just think they're kind of inconsistent this year. So, you know, I'm trying to be nonpartisan. Like, I'm not going to quote Emerson to give, you know, support for John Fetterman in Pennsylvania or for to give support for Dr. Oz in Pennsylvania and Masters in Arizona, but then, you know, support a Democrat in Kansas. Because their polls have just been really bad all around this year, and it's just not a good polling firm. So it does kind of you know suck that we haven't gotten any like, good polls out of Kansas in a while. Uh, that being said, I think partisanship saves Derek Schmidt. He's not been running that great of a campaign, but he's still a statewide official. And Laura Kelly, uh, you know, I think there'll be a lot of people who don't mind her, but are still going to vote for Schmidt. Now, Arizona, I think this would be the closest state because Katie Hobbs is like a bit of momentum in these final you know few weeks. I, I, I think Carrie Lake is a clear favorite, but. I don't want to bet too much against Katie Hobbs because, again, putting as lean R things, I'm, I like, think she's like a clear underdog. She has a path, and I think I can make the case for her. But what I will say is that um, I am pretty sure she's going to run behind Kelly in the suburbs specifically, and that's going to hurt her because, again, Arizona is a very suburban state, ton of moderates in that area that you know broke for Biden and Kelly in 2020, I think, are breaking for Kelly this time around. But um, Hobbs, not so much. 
she's you know she's like, she's closed the gap in the polls uh because she was like trailing kelly by like six seven percent in every poll and now she's only trailing by like three or four percent so i think her like she has a better chance now than she did you know maybe three or four weeks ago and the early vote in arizona as i talked about in the previous video she should go watch does look really good for democrats so i think hobbs is like a puncher's chance and i think you know maybe she's Maybe better than that, but I think, you know, she has a chance here and she's been closing the gap. She's kind of closed a bit stronger than I expected originally, but at the end of the day, Arizona is a bit more Republican down ballot and Carrie Lake to run a stronger campaign overall, which is what really matters here. So I think Arizona at this point tilt R. Now, I do want to show you guys my final margin predictions, which I've pulled up here. So, you know, if you want to screenshot, if you want to do anything here, you can do that. So you can come back and laugh at me when I'm horribly wrong in a few days. We'll see. I, I feel actually pretty confident about the, these races. Again, these are the races that I think will be under 15. So just thought I'd put that out there. But um, yeah, I, I think if like if you made me just for real talk here, like if you made me pick a race or a race or two that I'm not confident about, I'd say Arizona and Kansas. I think I could easily be overestimating Republicans there, especially because the recent polls have trended towards the Democrats. But again, I think partisanship is what matters most here in these states are down ballot Republican. And on the flip side, I do think Republicans have an underrated chance of potentially stealing, you know, maybe Maine or Minnesota, or you know, not really Minnesota, maybe like Maine, if I had to guess. I, th I think New Mexico still could be close to the people think either way. But um, again, I, I feel pretty confident with this map, um, you know. Uh, so, yeah, I, I don't think there's much to say after that. So this is my final governor's prediction, guys. I hope I, you know, first of all, I do want to say it's, it's been pretty crazy. To, this is like the 20th of these I've done in the past two years for this specific midterm and it's been really fun and i you know it's crazy to look back i looked back at my 20 year february governor's map and i had like nevada blue arizona blue georgia blue but i had michigan red i think i had pennsylvania red so a lot of things changed and so we're gonna have to see now um please do like this video please subscribe if you have not already please tell me your predictions so we can see come back if you say see which commenter got it most right i'll pin the comment that got it most right and i'll you know respond and say good job so um yeah and Obviously, if you haven't voted already, go vote. If you have voted, great. Thank you so much. And um, I think that's all I have to say. I'll see you guys in my uh, podcast tomorrow. There'll be the final prediction podcast, which will be coming out Sunday morning. And then I'll do my final house prediction on Monday. My final sound prediction will be out on Election Day morning. So it's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening. I'm going to see you hopefully in the next video. Bye, guys.